Hello, everybody, and welcome tonight to Carol Broadcasting Edition of our profile stories here on the website. Again, brought to you by Western Iowa Networks. And tonight, I've got some very special uh, guests in the studio with me here this evening. I've got uh, Bruce Ballmeister joining me here today, along with uh, Cliff Kincaid. I've uh, got Terry Kaspabauer here to my left, also uh, Marty Vanderheiden here to my right, and Eric Noggle. And we're going to be talking about uh, a former Carroll Tiger in uh, Aaron Bowman, uh, who passed away here recently of cancer. But Aaron, an outstanding athlete to, to come through uh, the Carroll High uh, football program and, and, and athletics in general and uh, we just wanted to tell his story and uh, let's start off with Bruce over here to my left. Bruce you said Aaron moved to town in the seventh grade. What's your first memory of meeting him? I uh, really didn't uh, know Aaron until, we, until he was out on the football field for us really. Uh, I'm actually a couple years older than Aaron and um, had no idea who he was until uh, he was out on the field with us and Got to know him real quick after that. What are some of the early stories then? How did he introduce himself to you? Was it a big hit or, or, or what happened? <laughs> uh, well, he did run up the backside of me more than once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, one of the first games he actually, uh, I was a center, so I had to do a lot of reach blocks, and I ended up on the ground one time. And he, on the way through the line, he stomped on the back of my leg, and I'm limping back to the huddle. And uh, get back in the huddle, I said, dang, Aaron, you st stomped on my leg. And he's like, you shouldn't have been down there. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he sounds like an intense guy, but I knew him a little bit, uh, you know, through his daughter and softball over the years. And just seems like one of the nicest guys as well you're going to meet. And one of those guys that maybe flipped that switch when he stepped inside the white lines. Yeah, he was a real soft-spoken guy. Uh, wasn't a rah-rah type of leader, but he was definitely a leader on our team, even as, as a young freshman. Um, he led through example. He was always hardest working, never um, had the spotlight on him. He was always uh, for the team and always was one of the hardest workers you're ever going to see. Bruce, how difficult is it for a, you know, a, an upperclassman to let a freshman maybe come in and take over leadership right away? Um, actually, a couple years prior to uh, Aaron coming to the team, our football team was not very good, obviously. And we... Uh, uh, we didn't have a real good team atmosphere at Carroll High. Uh, Terry Ballman came, and that helped change that a lot. And um, and it really wasn't all that tough for us to – we all – the guys that were there wanted to win and were willing to do the work. And uh, and when we saw a young guy come in with that kind of talent, we, we welcomed him in. There was really never any question. He always fit in right away from the beginning. Do you have a story you can tell us about him uh, that, you know, along with him stepping on you several times that maybe not everybody else knows? Um, it, there, it's all really on the football field. I, I, he, uh, um, some of the other stories I probably can't share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, as a, as a football player, as a lineman, uh, it's not really a glory position on the field, which everybody knows. And blocking for Aaron made it. Uh, exciting because there was nothing better than than you getting the guy in front of you out of the way or making it to that second level and getting the linebacker out of the way and then watching Aaron run over some poor defensive defensive back <laughs> that's out there just filling his pants really so. <laughs> and and that was our our reward was watching him run over guys he was a battering ram of a running back and he just ran over guys all the time and that was motivation for us I mean that fired me up fired up our line and, and kept us um, wanting to block for him all the time. I mean, any lineman that uh, is worth his salt is going to tell you that his favorite thing to do is to is to run block and grind it out and, uh, and drive block guys. And um, Aaron made you want to, for one, either he was going to run you over, uh, <laughs> but you wanted to watch him run over a guy. When you went to film the next day and watched some of his runs, that was the best part was watching Aaron just – plow over guys uh, that was it was one of my favorite things you would watch that guy run who had the chance to play with him in junior high did anybody get to know him in the seventh grade no no, no. coach do you have any recollection of him from from the junior high days no I didn't come to Carroll I just started coaching at Carroll High School when he was a sophomore so I didn't even see him his freshman year Okay. Anybody else? Let's move over now here uh, to Marty Vanderheiden, who's just to my right here. And Marty, uh, tell us, what was it like? When was the first day you met him? Was it in class, or did you get to know him through the football field as well? Uh, mainly through the football field. Um, Aaron, uh, we 
like I said, it, when a, a freshman walks in and he's just as big as the rest of sophomores, you're like, hmm, we're, we're going to have something here. So we, we stepped up right away and walked him in, and we went from there. That was in the weight room, too. That kid was always in the weight room. I mean, I remember stories. His car broke down outside of town here, and uh, instead of going to a house and getting help to get to the weight room, he walked. He actually walked to the weight room and came in and started lifting weights right away. Didn't even act like anything was wrong. <laughs> was he one of the better lifters from the day that he walked in there? Uh, Marty. <laughs> I, <laughs> Marty was <laughs> <laughs> I tried catching him on everything. <laughs> he just, he wanted to be good at everything. And he knew that if he lifted, he would be good. And and he went after it. And he set goals. He reached those goals. Um, so, I mean, that was one thing about Aaron, too. And then he would encourage you to, to meet him at the same goal and get up there. So Probably a few years ago now, but do you remember any idea how much he was lifting and how much he maybe pushed you in the weight room? Um, I don't. Um, he pushed us a lot. I know that was back when, I mean, I think there was kids barely before us there's kids barely at 200, 225 to where I know when we were seniors, we had a bunch of kids at 300, you know, benching, squatting over 300, close to 400, you know, and then after we left, it was, it just skyrocketed after that. I mean, kids were lifting big, but like I said before that, our football team wasn't that good, but we, you barely had kids 200, you know, 225 lifting. And when he came along and we all got together and started lifting weights and went from there. Was it crazy for you in a way to believe that one guy could come in and, and especially an underclassman like that, a freshman, and just kind of mentally get everybody as focused as they needed to be and doing the right things? Right, yeah. I. It's crazy one guy, but actually, like you said, we, we all kind of looked. We wanted to win. We all wanted to win. We wanted to be good. And we seen him, and we knew that if we got a team together, he would lead us. What are your favorite stories from him or memories uh, from him on the football field um, or even after off of the football field? Um, there's his dedication. Even after football, he would encourage other kids, younger, younger classmen, you know, hey, go out, or even classmen that didn't go out, go off for football. Um, football, I, I think I got to play with him on both sides. I was offense and defense, nose guard, and he pretty much he tapped me saying, you're going this way, I'm going this way, and and – of course, he always got the tackle. He always made the tackle. <laughs> <laughs> and if I did go the wrong way, he plowed me over to make the tackle. So, um, but like with Bruce, as, as being lineman with him, we loved blocking for him because it was fun seeing him. But we knew if we didn't get off the ball, he was going to train. He was going to rail us right over because he was going somewhere. Did he ever say anything to you guys in the game? Make any comments or anything? No. The only thing is, I would say I, I kind of remember him saying. Just make the hole for me, guys. I'll get there. And that's, well, even if we didn't do it, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> How many years did you play with him? Uh, two years. Two years? Yeah. How much better was he maybe as a sophomore than what he was even as a freshman? I I would, I think, a lot, I mean, he was good. Don't quote me. I mean, he was good. He was a fullback. Chad Ross was tailback his freshman year. So, I mean, he had a another leader behind him that was showing him the ropes too. So, but um, he learned a lot from Ross and, and I think he brought that sophomore year and, and really went after it. And he, unbelievable. Let's move over now with uh, Terry Kaspabauer who, who just stood here a few moments ago that uh, you came to town when he was a sophomore. Uh, what was your first experiences with him? <laughs> that he was a sophomore that didn't look like a sophomore and didn't play like one. It's, um, like these guys said, the program was not very good. Um, you know, you can look past at the records. And 1973, the first year Iowa high school started playoffs, and through Aaron's sophomore year, which is 91, Carroll High never made the playoffs. Only had four winning seasons. Okay, so that's a, that's about a 20-year span where not very good football. Since that time, Carroll's made the playoffs. I think it's like 15 times, and have had only three non-winning seasons. So these guys were all part of it too, but Aaron was the, the, the main cog in that, uh, turning the program around. The other thing is, is he holds the f 
first, second, and fifth most yards rushing in a season. And up until three years ago, he had the top three yards uh, years of rushing. And two of those years, we never made the playoffs, so we only played nine games. His senior year, we made the playoffs, so we played ten games. He got hurt partway through the season, so he and we had a fellow by the name of John Feld who transferred over. <laughs> And uh, both of them went over 1,000 yards that year. So John took a lot of the carries away that Aaron probably would have had. Uh, so you think about the playoff teams we've had. So all those running backs have played at least 10 games, some 11, even 12 games. And he did it playing nine games. So, uh, yeah, he was, he was definitely, uh, you know, I've told you before, 25 years I've been in Carroll, and we've had a lot of good football players. Uh, we still, I would say, none of, none of them are as good as he was. What was he like to coach? Oh, <laughs> if he had 35 or 40 of those guys. <laughs> uh, we a lot do, of state we, titles? Yeah, a lot of state titles, and we do this till we went into the grave. Uh, <laughs> but he was a quiet leader, like these guys have said. Uh, you didn't hear a lot of rah-rah from him. He was quick to give credit to the other linemen especially. Um, and he was just, uh, when, you know, he played both ways. Fullback and and middle linebacker and is the leader of both sides of the ball, punter. If we wanted him to return punts and kickoffs, he probably would have done that too. So, uh, yeah, just one of those kids. And 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 Marty talked about him walking to the weights. I remember one time him bringing a tractor, parking it out in the parking lot because he was went to work before he came to the weights at seven in the morning or whatever time we started back then, and uh, he won get there, he didn't want to miss weight, so he just drove the tractor that he was on into the, in the town and parked it in the parking lot and came in and lifted weights. <laughs> Have you had anybody that's been close to that where they've been that dedicated over the years? Oh, I, not that I know of, no. Not, uh, you know, and you're talking you know, 20 some years ago where uh, weightlifting wasn't as common as it is mm -hmm. now. Uh, you don't have all the programs, nothing, you know, it wasn't computers and all the technology and uh, so, uh, no, what he brought, uh, uh, there's no one that compares to him, I don't think. Did you get a chance to teach him in class or anything? Uh, no. What kind of student was no. he? Did you, do you know? No, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, because I was, I was running the alternative school then. So, uh, but, you know, I'm sure I can't imagine him being a troublemaker uh, in classroom. He, uh, you know. And the the big you know big thing with Coach Baldwin is you you know you you got to be a good student and whatever happens in the classroom we're going to find out about it eventually mm -hmm. and uh, there's ways of paying for it on the football field during practice. <laughs> what kind of person was he afterwards? Did you stay in touch with him after he graduated? I know he stayed here in town and and uh, you know did you is was he one of those guys that still twenty years later you you talk to every now and then? Yeah, not so much right away. It was more when Brittany got into high school. Mm -hmm. I really didn't see him around that much um, right after high school. And then you know, I was busy coaching three sports, so I didn't always have a lot of time either. But once Brittany got to high school and see him at games, same real quiet spoken Aaron Bowman and, uh, you know, friendly to talk to, but he, 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 I never heard him yell during the game as an official whether it be on the basketball floor or, or umpire in the softball game. And uh, you know, he was the same type of person. He was still big <laughs> and uh, would not want to meet him in a dark alley and uh, if he was mad at me. So, Any stories that you can tell us about him on the field, offensively, defensively, um, in practice? You know, one thing I remember, I, I think if I remember right, we were playing St. Albert's. Uh, they were in our district, and they had a defensive back that, you know, was tired of getting beat up by Aaron, and and he was going as low as he could to tackle Aaron because that was the only way he had a chance of getting him. And he was almost parallel to the ground, and somehow Aaron got his shoulder pads lower than him. And I'm watching this from the sidelines, thinking, how can somebody get that low, run him over, and <laughs> continue on to the end zone? Because he was, his shoulder pads couldn't have been two or three inches above the ground. That's how low he had to get to be lower than the, the defensive back and. Uh, I, I still have that vision in my mind watching from the sidelines thinking, how is that humanly possible to get that low and still keep running? But he was able to do it. Some of this sounds like it was natural for him. Was it some of it natural talent or was it just how hard he worked? Well, I, it's a combination. He obviously had some natural ability, but he took advantage of the ability he had and then he worked to, 
to make himself better. Um, coach Stride was his coach, we could, position yep. coach. We could say it was all Coach Stride <laughs> if we wanted to. He co coached him on offense and defense. So, uh, but no, he was, you know, and, uh, you know, my first year, uh, I said, we were three and six here in sophomore year. And I first game we beat Audubon, who was a preseason top ten team, and. Uh, Game gets over, and the first thing the players do is they throw water all over us, Gator. And I'm thinking, <laughs> the program really needs to have higher expectations because if we're going to beat, you know, and I'm used to, I was used to playing at a bigger school, and I'm thinking Ottoman's not. You know, at that time, North Carolina wasn't a very big school. So, uh, we, yeah, we go three and six, and we got dumped on three times. And like Coach Bowman always told him, we got to expect to win. And so those water showers aren't so uh, regularly. That, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, from where it went then, you know, like I said, the, the 25 years I've been here and how successful the program has become, it's all back to when these guys started and Aaron being the leader of that. And speaking of Coach Drive, he was not able to make it tonight but did send me a text message with some comments about Aaron. He said Aaron was the one player that turned our football program into a consistent winner. He was a man playing against boys. He says we actually ran plays where we didn't block the outside linebacker in and it simply let Aaron just run him over. His yardage would grow from four yards a carry in the first quarter to eight yards a carry in the second quarter, and then he was just unstoppable in the second half. Uh, coach Stribe says he was the running back coach, and it called the defense with him at middle linebacker. It was truly an honor to be associated with uh, Aaron Bowman. Uh, let's move over now here uh, to my uh, left again here, and uh, let's uh, bring into the uh, night with us here, uh, Cliff Kincaid. And, uh, Cliff, uh, how did you first meet Aaron, and what are some of your early memories of him? Well, me and Aaron were in the same grade, but since he was playing varsity as a freshman and I wasn't to that level yet, I honestly didn't even know him until a sophomore because he was always with the older guys. And uh, so it was about sophomore year when I got to start playing at the varsity level and I got to meet him. And uh, as these guys talked about being on the field, what I remember of him is uh, – on the offensive side, he would smile a lot. He, he enjoyed running the ball. And if we had a play that, that went well, he'd come back with this smile. And he, he always had big, teethy smile. And he'd be like, hey, let's do that one again. You know, I enjoyed that. But on the defense side, and Eric, you know this by playing, he, there was no jokes. And, and I, I can remember the look in his eyes. I mean, it was like prey. I mean, they, he was like a hunter. I mean, it, it was all business, and uh, I wasn't a, a very good defensive player, so I didn't play a lot. But I do remember, I do remember the look, and I, he was very intense. Was he like that in practice as well? Did you go up against him much in practice? Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, he he was business. I mean, it was a business to him, and uh, business was good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a chance to get to know him off the field then, in yeah. the classroom and stuff? Talk a little bit about that. You know, he was he was. You know, very quiet. Like everybody said, you know, he, he was funny. Uh, and not a, like a raunchy type funny like normal teenage boys would. <laughs> you know, and at times I imagine. But how I remember him, he was he was just, uh, he had a one-liner here or there. And, uh, but always respectful, never talked during class. Um, that, that's how I remember him during school. So a leader off the field as much as he was on? Yeah, yeah. And like... Coach was saying, uh, Terry Bauman always told us, you know, you, we're team whether we're on the field or not. Uh, and if we had problems with each other off the field, we needed to resolve it before we got on the field because we could, we could never be a team on the field if we weren't a team off the field. Jeff Blankman with you here tonight, uh, again talking about Aaron Bowman, a former Carroll High graduate and uh, maybe the best football player ever at Carroll High School. And joining me here tonight, Bruce uh, Baumeister again, Eric Noggle, Terry Kaspabauer, uh, Marty Vanderheiden, and Cliff Kincaid. And right now we're talking with Cliff. Uh, I've given everybody kind of a chance to talk about some of their favorite memories. Do you have a story, anything from a game or a practice that, that you kind of is a, a memory for you? Well, I remember, I believe it was Shenandoah we were playing, and uh, – Aaron got hurt because basically it was Aaron versus 11. <laughs> I mean, as a lineman, you know, these guys were correct. You, you level the guy in front of you, and then you kind of look up and see where Aaron's at. I mean, that, that's just the way it was. 
And uh, I remember looking up, and he's carrying half the, if not <laughs> over half the Shenandoah kids down the field. And it, it was it, it was pretty amazing to see. And uh, like I said, I was I was a little younger than these guys, so by the time I got there, the, the got to be playing varsity anyway. We were starting to be good, and uh, Aaron had always made it a made it a point to say, "Hey, the the line are, are they're the ones that give me the first couple yards, and then I go from there." You need to give them credit. So, I, as these guys didn't get a lot of credit early on, I was I got to get a lot of that credit. <laughs> so, I, so I always loved it for that. You know, I mean, you know, I, I made all state my senior year, and. Um, if it wasn't for him and, and John uh, Feld, I wouldn't have got that. You don't get that recognition. You know, you, a good team breeds off of, you know, good players breed off of other good players. What was it like for you to be a part of what really kind of started as the success came as you got up there to really start turning things around? It was awesome. I mean, I don't know how other, else to put it. I mean, um, Outside of outside of football, I mean that that was what a lot of us had. We didn't have anything else, and uh, we that we were we were we were kings at that time. You know, I mean, in in the school because we were you know like my senior year, we were undefeated. That's it's 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 a great feeling, and uh, you know, and Aaron was like I said, we were all men of. Amongst boys, it's the truth. We were we had a lot of good players, but he did stick out amongst of an, above and beyond all the good players. Let's bring in now Eric Noggle, uh, who's still on the Carroll coaching staff here. And Eric, uh, your first memories of him, and and what are some of your stories? Well, I have the different aspect. I was the youngest one of the group. All these guys were ahead of me, so I kind of hung out with the older boys. Um, <laughs> Aaron. These guys have all said it. He was just a quiet guy and didn't say much. But, I mean, when he, as soon as he put the shoulder pads and helmet and walked outside the building to go play, it was business. And, I mean, when you're at practice, it wasn't joking around and, you know, having fun a little bit. You had fun by getting better, and everybody saw that you had fun by getting better. And it was a war. I mean, we battled each other. And it wasn't like, okay, don't hit Aaron because, you know, he's an all-state. He's, he wanted to get hit. And if you didn't hit him, he'd get mad. You need to hit me because everybody else is going to hit me. So, you know, you had that aspect of it, and you're scared to death. So you're like, all right, I'm going to give him everything I got. And I, I tried everything possible to hit him, and I hit him, and hit, he'd get back up and look at me, and he'd hit me. I mean, just go back and forth. And he was just a quiet guy that went he went to work every day. What did you learn from him then? Did, did you take any of the way he played and try to incorporate that maybe into your style? Yeah, I, was, I played inside linebacker next to him for – Two years, yeah, sophomore. And then junior year when we were undefeated. And uh, he was a leader. And I would, back, that was back in the day when you got in the huddle and he'd look at the sideline and Coach Stride would give over the signals and back and forth. And he just took command of the huddle. I mean, when guys were there, it was shut up and listen. And it was just – and he said what it was and you did what you needed to do. And he just – all these guys said he wasn't rah rah, get after it, scream in your face, grab you by the face mask. He was just like, let's go to work, punch the time clock, and go to work. And you know, so you kind of took that aspect and tried to lead it on and and carry it on as you're going through and just you know, and being a young sophomore when he was a junior and being a junior when he was a senior, you know, they double teamed him a lot, and I made a lot of tackles because of it. And you know, he never complained about it, and he never said anything. He just looked at me. He says. They're going to double me. You better make all the tackles. So it wasn't like you're going to. It's you better. So it's okay if I don't. You know, he's he's going to get upset and move over here, and then I'm going to get, you know. So, I mean, he just showed you how to play the game. He, he played it the right way. I think John Feld said it the best when we were all sitting around after we heard he passed. And he, he probably said it the best, him and Heath. He was a one percenter. You know, we talk about that, you know, motorcycle gangs of one percent. He was a one percent. You're not going to find a guy like that in too many groups, and that's what he was. How difficult was it the year after he left to, to maybe have to try and follow what he had started? Well, these guys set the tone. I mean, we, they go 9-0, and oh and we jump to 3A, you know, and everybody in my class, they were, we were a little arrogant. I'm not going to say we weren't. <laughs> but, you know, we had big shoes to fill up. I mean, they, we started it. 
three and six to what were we five and four to nine and zero, oh, and then come back and you're like, all right, we're gonna make it or six and three, six and three, not five. So we go with that route, and then all of a sudden, here we are. You got to put the shoes on, and those were some big shoes to fill. I mean, Josh Tancredi played fullback for us at the time, and God bless him, he tried everything in his power to live up in those shoes. But Aaron was six three, two thirty five, playing fullback, and John Feld was. Five foot ten, two fifteen, and our offensive line weighed one hundred and ninety five pounds. Well, the other thing is, we went from playing Griswold, Panora, Audubon, Missouri Shenandoah, Valley, Shenandoah, Missouri Valley, to Johnston, Boone, Milwaukee, Norwalk. <laughs> and also the competition level obviously went up. And and you know, going from two A to three A was a was a was a big step for us. And we probably got as much out of that team as we did the other three to go we went four and five and competed in, in most of the games we were right there with not as much talent as we had the previous years but to go in four and five just remember coaching back then is that we were not happy with the record obviously but we were happy with the effort we got from the kids and thought that four and five was better than we probably deserved with the talent we put on the field compared to who we were playing and making that step up from 2a to 3a yep. Do you guys – did he ever come back after he graduated and, and stop in, visit practice or anything? Or no, he, he went just... to – he went to U.S. – I know he went on a couple of college visits and then ended up at USD – South Dakota South State. South Dakota State, yeah. sorry. And then I think he got hurt. He hurt his knee or something. And then Michelle um, had or was pregnant with Brittany, their, their uh, daughter. And so then he – and these guys know it. He just kind of vanished off the face. He was a quiet guy. and yeah. His close friends kind of knew him, but you never really knew who he was. So, I mean, Michelle would know more than anybody. He spent time with Michelle from day one. I mean, that's a guy that showed – I mean, he, you said it. He knew from the time he met his wife now that she was the one. And he spent as much time – and, I mean, he probably spent a lot of time with him hunting and fishing and stuff, but he just vanished. I mean, nobody knew where he was. I mean, you see him every once in a while driving truck for Jurgens or – Somebody else, Reesburg or somebody, or Prudence, and then that's it, <laughs> you know. You mentioned here a little bit ago his passing. How shocked were you when you heard the news that he that he was not doing well? Well, I heard it at the football game at halftime, which was, you know, I'm walking in, put my headset, and here I hear it, and I'm like, what in God's creation is going on here? So I know nothing about it, and we kind of all just, you know, we all kind of get together like, what's going on? And, you know, we all went up and visited him, and – I think it was hard for everybody to see somebody that was so – in our mind, Aaron was big. I mean, he's just a big presence. And uh, to see somebody so fragile and so – I mean, he wasn't giving up. I mean, no doubt in my mind. We all sat there. We all talked about it. If anybody was going to beat this, I mean, 7% beat it, he was going to be the one. I mean, we all, no doubt in our mind. And I think they found out in June – and all of a sudden, there it was. So we, we all he thought, working, yeah, he, he worked up a week before he we went to the hospital. So, I mean, he was there to take care of his family, and, you know, those guys kept him through, and we were shocked as anybody. Marty, let's move back over to you. And after you found out he was sick, what was it like for you? Um, kind of a reality check because I'm a little bit older, a couple years older than him, and, and like I said, the only times I've seen him too was – driving semi or I'd see him in the grocery store or something and just say hi and when I heard about it it it, it hit home a little bit because we we were so close all of us guys back back then during because football like I said we didn't have much back then football brought us as a family and he was he was the head family and so when when he went down you know found out he had cancer it, it, you like Eric said He's, he's going to beat it. He'll be all right, but we have to go see him. It was brought chills to me because it's just like it can't be. You know, he's he's an animal. There's no way that, that he can't go down like that. So um, it was tough, real tough. Bruce Ballmeister back with us on the mic now. Uh, Bruce, what's things been like since he's passed? You, have you guys gotten together and shared stories a few times and kind of shared <laughs> memories? Got a headache from it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, – we, we did, a group of us guys all got together, uh, some of them sitting here with me right now, and, uh, and then also uh, Aaron's father-in-law came down, and, and um, his, 
his daughter's fiance. She's engaged to be married. And uh, we all sat around and told stories and uh, some things we could talk about here, some things we can't, some things we did talk about yeah. that night. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was like therapy for all of us because it, uh, it was a shock. Um, Aaron, uh, being so young, he's got his daughter. Brittany is the same age as my son, and um, she's two years younger than my daughter. And so he and I went to a lot of ASA softball stuff um, together and uh, and saw each other a lot at those kinds of things. And, um, you know, Brittany and Michelle were his whole life. And, uh, you know, Brittany were, excuse me, Michelle was his high school sweetheart. Uh, they've been together since, I, he, she might have been his first girlfriend. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and they've been together forever. And though Brittany and Michelle were his life, and he would do anything for those two. Um, I, I didn't even know it, but he even built in the back of his garage, built the garage long enough so that way Brittany could practice mm -hmm. pitching in the back of his garage. And, um, you know, all you see is pictures of Brittany and him hunting together. And, you know, uh, it's just, uh, it's tough to see that kind of stuff. You know, you know, with my own kids, it makes you think a lot about that kind of thing. So, um, you know, Aaron was the, not only, a, we talked a lot about him being a great football player, but... He was a great man. He was a good husband, great father. Um, you know, so he's the kind of person I would want my kids to grow up to be like. So he was a good guy. You said you got the chance to kind of be around him at some of the ASA softball stuff and stuff. What was he like there? Was he just the kind of the quiet Aaron that you always knew? Yeah. I mean, he would occasionally, come on, Brittany, you need to pick it up. Or that's about as rowdy as he got. <laughs> and and Brittany would give him the look, you know, like all teenage kids do. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, I would have said a lot more to my daughter. <laughs> but uh, he didn't need to. And uh, you know, just like you said earlier, I, you just knew what he didn't have to say much to get his point across. So um, you know, he was he was that way always. I knew there was never any difference. He was uh, really a no nonsense kind of guy. And really salt of the earth type of person. Cliff, let's bring you back in for some more comments here tonight. Um, the guys talk about how good of a guy he was. You guys have talked about how he keeps working and kept working through all of this. Does that surprise you at all? Not at all. Uh, like Coach had said before, he brought a tractor in to lift weights. And uh, I, I, I just remember I was one of the very few guys that could lift more than him. <laughs> and... The thing that that uh, really shocked me, and once as you get older and realize what work does to a person, you know, he, he probably worked 30 hours a week and went to school and practiced and lifted weights. And so, and I remember giving him a hard time one time because I was lifting more than him. And he was like, why, why don't you come with me and let's see, you know, I'll load about four or five five gallon buckets full of corn and you show me how you're going to get them from one point to the other and that was one thing Aaron's hands you guys his he had the most strongest hands of anybody I've ever known and when we get into you know beating the crap out of each other you know <laughs> in the locker rooms and stuff like that he if he grabbed a hold of you I mean he the he just was very strong that's I don't even know how I'll say it, but to say that he worked right up to the end, no, there's no doubt in my mind that I mean, I he 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 did. He worked 30 hours. That, that's that's just crazy. Uh, I I doubt that you see many kids doing that now. And uh, I, I mean, I didn't do that. I, we when football season was over, we'd get a job, make money till the next sport came along. Uh, he just kept on doing it, and um, he, he was he was a machine. He just, and like Bruce said, he, he's somebody that you'd want your son to grow up to be. I mean, he really would. And as far as with Michelle and Brittany, he, he was. Uh, when we when we were kids and we'd go run and, and be reckless and crazy and everything, he, he always had he always um, had them on his mind. And he, he always knew. He always knew that he was going to have a family with, with Michelle, and he just he just did he, that, and that's probably the thing that made him a great father and um, athlete was Aaron. What Aaron knew, he knew, and 
He was, and that was all there was to it, and he was going to do it. Coach Kaspavar, let's bring you back in. Any final thoughts on Aaron or the legacy that he's left at Carroll? Well, I think what I said before, you know, about the way the program has evolved into since since he was in high school, says a lot. Um, you know, there's very – Coach Drive and I are the only coaches left at the high school that were there coaching when when he was playing. Um, and then Coach Noggle was a player, and these guys were players. And uh, But – when Coach Drive and I start talking about the old days when we coached together, um, Aaron's name was always the first one brought up because it was like there was no doubt, you know, that was he was the catalyst for everything else that uh, that came about in our program. And uh, you know, I I was like Eric the first time I found out about it was at the halftime of the football game, you know, and here we are what three weeks later, four weeks later, and. You know, uh, and I've both my parents passed away from cancer, so I know what cancer can do for you. But I'm like these guys. When I heard Aaron, oh, don't Aaron will Aaron will beat this. He's if anyone's going to beat it, it would be Aaron Bowman. He was just that type of kid, that that type of person. I still think of this kid, <laughs> that type of person that if if uh, anyone's going to be able to do something to beat some something or someone, then it would be him. So, Coach Noggle. Um, any thoughts that we haven't talked about? Any memories? Uh, any information? I know that there's been some fundraisers. Do you have any information on anything coming up? Yeah, there's a celebration of life. They changed it from a benefit to a celebration of life, and that will be this Saturday, the 24th. Um, Litterdale Parish Hall from 4 to 6. It's a silent auction from 4 to 6, and then I think they're doing a live auction from 6 to 7. Um, a lot of good things. I mean, the community... It's amazing the things that they've donated. I know there's food there, free will donation, and medical bills, and anything that they can, anybody can give is is amazing. But there's some there's some cool stuff out there. Nate Hall, who was a former player, um, who lives in Nebraska, is actually traveling back tomorrow night to um, drop off. I think it's like a six or seven foot wood carving that he did of an eagle, and it's it's beautiful. And I know there's wood benches and crafts, you know, and there's things for little kids and, you know, hair stuff and boutique stuff that Cliff would like to go to. But, um, I mean, so that's going to be that night. And then um, I don't know if they still have the Fund Me page or anything, but I think they'll take any donation that's possible. I know there's a gun drawing that all of us have tickets. If you need tickets, you can get a hold of us at any time or get a hold of you and we'll find a way. But, heck, you can show up at the banquet, I think, and turn them in and buy them there. So, That'll be this Saturday, and then just as much we can to help the family. And I know if they were here, they would say thank you. There's not enough. I mean, on behalf of them, we'll say thank you for the community giving as much as they have. This Carroll community is great for that. And it just goes to show what type of person Aaron was that we go out and ask, and there's no questions. They're like, might not have known him, but I heard of him. And sometimes that's all you need. Guys, anybody else got anything they want to add about Aaron Bowman? All right, thank you very much, guys. Again, joining me here tonight, Bruce uh, Ballmeister, uh, Cliff Kincaid, Marty Vanderheiden, Eric Noggle, and Terry Kaspabar. This is Jeff Blankman saying thank you, thank you very much for listening to the story of Aaron Bowman.